Right on. Welcome back. Here we are. The much anticipated Rad Ruby Tracks After Dark, episode four. Um, finally going to get into the big unveil of uh, a new product that's going to shake the track conversion world. So how are you doing tonight, Scott? Great. Yourself, Nick? All good, man. All good. It's great to be back here with you and uh, super excited about sharing this uh, new product with the world. Yeah, I'm doing my best to hide it right now, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, uh, for sure yeah it's cool to get a look at the shop too i see you've got all kinds of uh uh parameters measurements and uh specs up there on the blackboard behind you huh yeah that's my secret weapon up there it keeps me from having to remember the simple shit so, there you go nothing wrong with that yeah. Well, good deal, man. Yeah. So we're uh, back again. And specifically this evening, we're here to discuss uh, the mountain track. So mm -hmm. we've had a couple teasers in our past episodes. Uh, we've talked about a few of the features that make these different uh, or maybe hinted at them. Yeah. Um, but what probably makes the most sense to start is kind of going back to the genesis. So mm -hmm. you've been building track conversions for wheeled vehicles uh, what has it been, 10, almost 10 years or a little over? Yeah, I'd say it's been 10 years now. Okay. When we started, I started out, it was, it was called Polar Tracks at the time. And then uh, uh, life got in the way. We sold that company to an outfit in the U.S. that didn't do much with it. And then once I got restructured here back in my homeland, Prince Edward Island, I uh, I started all again with, with Ruby Tracks. So we've been building Ruby Tracks. I think this is... The fifth season. Okay. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So um, through, you know, the two lines between polar tracks, kind of getting your feet on the ground and figuring everything out, moving into Ruby tracks. I know there had been a few times before we knew each other where you were kind of experimenting with some different stuff, whether it was belt lengths or um, layout. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I've always been trying different things to see what works best and, uh, see what catches people's attention, I guess. Yeah. Um, I know personally, like I've been operating my own business here in the Sierra Nevada. Um, I guess we're going on seven years now. Mm -hmm. So January, uh, this coming January will be eight. Um, and in addition to serving like clientele that is out in remote locations, uh, I've got into the off-road recovery game. So right. when I was, when I was growing up, I raced motocross on an ATV wound up moving to colder climates and uh, having a sport ATV didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Right. So I got into utility quads, four wheel drives. And since I was living in snowy climates, uh, you know, Camzo had come out with the track kit. Um, I think Polaris had a couple that were kind of private label mm -hmm. and those were starting to be a thing maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So I got one and started using tracked ATVs in my business and for off-road recoveries. And when I decided to uh, go ahead and get a track conversion for my rock crawler, my Toyota 4Runner, mm -hmm. um, you know, looked at the market, looked at what was out there. And, you know, visually, I was impressed with the Ruby Track product when I first saw it. Uh, but what really sold me was calling you. And we had a little chat. We didn't know each other at all, right? Total strangers just on the phone. But as I shared some of my experiences and the things that I was looking for in a track kit, uh, you were very receptive to that. So I had mentioned um, a high nose was something that I was interested in getting that front bogey wheel up. And you, you know, you were able to take care of me and provide that mm -hmm. in my custom set of uh, custom set of Ruby tracks. So you and I, you know, you built that set. I've been running it now in this type of country for uh, three seasons. Yeah. And we've been able to kind of share, kick around a few more ideas and, bring this new uh, Ruby track mountain kit to life. The big brother to what you have, I guess is what we'll call it. Yeah, sure thing. So it's very cool. Um, I guess, you know, let's uh, see if we can slide you away and get into some of the details <laughs> of what, what really sets these things apart. Well, Nick, as you can see, let's see. If wow. We can get, uh, the camera a little bit. We yeah, there you go. Nose here, right? Now this nose, let's get the measuring tape. So uh, typically the nose on the, the 121 and the 136 would be uh, nine and a half inches before the track starts to redirect up over the sprocket. 
on the mountains, we're at 16 and a half inches. So that's a total of what, seven more inches? Sure. So that's seven more inches of snow that this thing will have incentive to climb over before it decides to try and submarine. And you know, sure. it's likely not going to want to submarine. Um, right. That's the first feature that's that's different. And the most notable, most obvious feature, I would say. And then yeah. like, to this side, we've got our larger drive sprocket. So on our on our 121 and a 136, I guess now we're calling the lake and the cross country. Uh, that right. sprocket was about 17, I think 17.6 inches in diameter, roughly. These sprockets are 20 inches. So that's not only going to give us a little bit uh, higher final drive, but it's also you know, theoretically going to give us a little bit more sprocket in contact with the track at any given point. So a little bit more grip on the track. Yeah, that makes sense, right? You're increasing as the uh, the diameter increases, the circumference is increasing. So you're getting a little more wrap on that larger sprocket. Exactly. Yeah. That's, you know, that's what we want. We're going to push the limits on these things. We want to grab, you know, we want to reinforce the connection between those two parts because that's where, that's where the power gets lost sometimes. Right. Sure. Yeah. So I think, um, so two things, uh, based on what you brought up that I think are important for the viewers to note. So, uh, we get asked all the time about the speed reduction when you put tracks on. So right. because of the way that these tracks are built, uh, the sprocket effectively becomes whatever diameter your sprocket is, uh, it, your, the relationship between your axle speed and your speed over ground is equivalent to that being your tire size, right? Exactly. Because you're driving, you're driving the belt one-to-one -one and the belt is running across the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've gone from, you said a 17 and a half inch sprocket now up to a 20. So for anyone out there that is trying to figure out their drive ratios, uh, you can use like the Grim Jeeper is a calculator online where you can drop in transmission ratios, axle ratios, um, and tire size, and it will give you speed at a given RPM. Right. So in this circumstance with these tracks, use 20 inches or 17.6 for your tire size, and you'll be able to quickly come up with a, a speed at a given RPM. Yeah. And then, so as we were talking about the high nose, uh, part of the reason I was interested in that originally, um, and that Scott has decided to take this, you know, that direction with the new mountain Ruby tracks, mountain track. Uh, so it does a couple things for you. Obviously, if you're running in, you know, technical challenging terrain, um, and you come up to obstacles, it's leading the track up and over obstacles, which is always cool. Uh, but in addition, when you have real deep snowpack, a certain amount of compaction is a given, right? Mm -hmm. No matter how light you are, even if you're wearing snowshoes, you sink into the snow a little bit. So as the track starts to sink by having that high nose, you're maintaining that positive attitude where the track is continually trying to climb up, keep you on top and moving forward. Yeah. And that's and especially important as the snow develops a crust as well, right? Because as soon as you get that little bit of crust, when you get under that crust, it's very difficult to get back over the crust, right? Yeah. And the way, you know, just the nature of snow, regardless of where you live and regardless of what type of snow you get, um, uh, even if it's really cold, right, you get settling and compaction that just gravity naturally condenses snow. Um, so every time you have a fresh uh, a storm comes through, you got a fresh foot or whatever, yeah. <clears throat> you've got different composition of snow from the top, right? You're working through different layers. So yeah. anything that you can do to keep that positive attitude, keep the track up on top where you want to be is a good thing. That's right. Well, very cool. So I can tell, you know, from the, the, the view here that you've got that high attack angle on the front. Um, and then it's different on the rear. So what's different about the rear track on the rear so, tracks mountain? Yeah. So the rear track, I'll see if I can sneak the, the view over here. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah, so, it looks like nine axles to me. It is, it is. It's so we're we're <laughs> seven and a quarter inches longer on the ground than the 136 inch. Right? Wow. And we put that entire seven and a quarter inches out the back for two reasons. One was to give us a little bit of clearance right here by the rocker panel because 
you know, it's much easier to manipulate the bumper than it is the rocker panel. And sure. the other reason is when you have to back up, sometimes it's nice to have like having more track out the back like that makes that end of the track lighter than the front end. Right. So when it reverses, sure. it's going to be more likely to want to climb up versus plow in or dig down in certain applications. We could put that centered. Like if you had like something like Dimitri's truck with the flatbed, um, it sure. probably, it probably worked just fine with that centered, but on most vehicles, most SUVs, we're dealing with, you know, body constraints, I would say that. Yeah. And especially when you get into four door models, right. You're basically dealing with a corner of a door. And yeah, exactly. Not... Right. You know, it's like I said, it's easier. Most of these vehicles now, the, the bumper is, is plastic and it's, you know, the, there's not much body actually behind the wheel, but in front it's all structure and you're not going to sure. cut your doors apart just to make the tracks fit. Right. So, and then that, you know, I mean, the other option is to lift the vehicle up and I mean, that, that works, that's great. But I mean, you know, as, as people have figured out over the years, when you really want to wheel, you want to get that center of gravity down as close to the ground as possible. So, you know, lift as little as necessary and make things fit. Sure. And so obviously the sprocket sizes themselves front to rear are the same, mm -hmm. uh, but since you have nine axles now, yep. uh, if I'm thinking about that right, you'd be taking rubber track off of the drive sprocket. So is there anything there that helps compensate that? So um, we're not necessarily taking any off um, because we've compensated again by making the tower here taller again. So what okay. that does is it, it that angle that you thought got shallower just got steeper again, right? So that's sure. very, very close to the same contact patch as what we should have. But to touch on what you're asking there is on that rear sprocket, we've actually gone and made it uh, like two and a half inches wider. So on the inside of that track, there's drive lugs. And we'll see if we can, let's see if we can do it. Why not take this thing around? These are what the track drives on, right? Yeah, we can see the nubs there. Yeah, you can see the nubs. So on the back here now, we made this sprocket grab five wide of these nubs. So we always, um, up until now, we we only grabbed four nubs, okay? So there's there's actually six rows of nubs in there because these are, you know, snowmobile tracks, and that's how the snowmobile generally grabs all six of them. So what we've we've done since we've enlarged that sprocket, it allowed us to make it wider without interfering with the brakes on the vehicle or other clearance issues and grab that fifth row. So now we've got 25% additional grip between that sprocket and the track itself. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. No, it should make a, a huge difference. Like ratcheting is, uh, as you know, it's it's kind of a necessary evil. Um, nobody likes it. It's a little bit embarrassing when it happens, but it saves your axles. You know, like the power's got to go somewhere because lots of times you can't, that track has so much grip on the ground, you can't spin it. Sure. So this is going to kind of, you know, fight back against that and, and help you transfer that power. That makes sense. And you, so you had mentioned that the tower uh, itself is now taller. So yeah. what is that? What is that dimension from the floor to the center line of your axle shaft? 23 and three quarter inches. Wow. Yeah. So I measured this earlier uh, today and this Jeep went up just shy of eight inches when we put the tracks on. So wow. that's, that's eight inches. And that's not like, that's not like, eight inch suspension lift where your axles are still the same height. Like everything went up eight inches. So you've got For eight sure. additional inches underneath your entire vehicle to clear the snow because like the goal is to ride on top of the snow. But as you said earlier, you sink into it no matter what. There's different snow compositions, whether it's fresh or compacted or whatnot. And the sure. higher you get the vehicle, the more snow it's going to clear, the more it's going to be allowed to sink and keep going. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, and anyone that's, you know, been an off-road person or has run big tires on their, on their vehicle, uh, knows that even if you buy a 46 inch tire, 
when it's mounted and, you know, depending on the air pressure, if you're running 46s, you're a serious snow wheeler. So you're yeah. probably running single, single digit air pressures anyway. Mm -hmm. So your effective, um, you know, your axle shaft center line, even on a 46 in single digits is probably in the neighborhood of 20 inches. So you're picking up a solid, you know, three and a half inches, even over running something like a 46 at single digit air pressures. That's immense. Yeah. We're, we're competing with, you know, 50 plus inch tires with these products and that's sure. just, just right just from an axle just from an axle clearance yeah. so and you're getting to run them on a vehicle like that jeep behind you looks fairly stock that jeep behind me is absolutely stock the only thing i did to it nick was take the mud flaps off okay so now now i'll, I'll say that i think the jeep is pretty much the only vehicle that you know you can do that with out of the box um sure with with the big tracks especially i know like the toyota tacomas would put the 121s on with no lift but even this jeep it'll run 121s 136s no problem no mods no lift nothing and it'll fit these mountains but i would strongly recommend anybody that's thinking of putting the mountains on that they get like at least a minimum of two inches ideally probably three inches and a stubby bumper is probably going to be a nice addition because right For now sure. Just enough room for my fist between the track and the bumper. And you know what's going to happen. That track's going to want to come up when you're climbing over the snow. And it's going sure. to that bumper and uh, and make some noise. So so I would recommend anybody thinking about mountains should have a slightly lifted Jeep. And if it's anything else, maybe a little bit more lift than stock. So probably targeting vehicles that are running around on 37 inch plus tires. Is that right? I would say, yeah. Yeah, right on. And I don't think we hit on um, specifically the belt, the rubber belt itself. Uh, what are the belt lengths on the Mountain Edition here? So on the front, we've got the 144 inch. And that's wow. 12 feet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's that's Camso Ripsaw. So all our other tracks are running the Camso Hacksaw, which is a one inch lug. Now the rip saw is a one and a quarter inch lug. So we got just a little bit more bite into the snow. The back one is 151. So it's over 12 feet, right? So, wow. Yeah, we'll have to do the math on that and see exactly what the PSI or maybe, I don't know if you did the math already. Did you do it with your Toyota, what your PSI would be? Yeah, so only with my existing, um, only with my existing tracks. I know that I wind up, uh, with my forerunner, it's a second gen forerunner. It's got a three, four V six dual transfer cases still on Toyota axles. Uh, they're built to the hilt, but they're relatively light. Uh, so my vehicle on the one thirty sixes uh, was almost exactly one pound per square inch. So one PSI, every square inch of snow surface was supporting one pound. Um, coincidentally, that puts me right in the ballpark of uh, like a Tucker XL snowcat. Yeah. So I operate uh, through my business. We have a, a joint venture and I operate four Tucker 2000 XL snowcats. We do remote access uh, for utility companies, <clears throat> cell, uh, cell phone providers and all that kind of stuff to keep their uh, infrastructure up and running. So we've been running cats for the past couple of winters. Uh, but even my Toyota on the existing 136 tracks has a comparable ground pressure. Right. Um, once a kit like this is put on, man, it'll be... You're going to be the roof. on PSI. You're going to gain somewhere, not quite 15% additional benefit from the from the additional footprint on these, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Because oh. even, it's hard for me to get out of the way here, the way this video zooms me in. Uh, right. This is my my personal tracked ATV. This is a Can-Am 1000. Um, and it's running the biggest uh, track kit for any ATV you can buy, uh, the Can-Am Backcountry uh, track setup. Mm -hmm. So this vehicle with me on it, with these tracks, is in the neighborhood of like 0.4, so just under half a pound. Yeah. Um, but like I said, that that outclasses most uh, snowcats. And, uh, you know, it's really amazing to see you get into those powder conditions and it's actually kind of floating almost more like a snowmobile does. Yeah. So to be able to take a pretty, a relatively stock vehicle like you have behind you, you know, get awesome ground pressure out of it, and then... When the weekend's through, you can pull the tracks right back off and throw tires on. That's a pretty amazing conversion to be able to happen in just over an hour.
And I've been trying to sell that angle forever. And and it sells. Like, I mean, there's so many older people, especially, they want a little bit more comfort. You know, they don't want to take a snowmobile to the cabin or to the ice shack anymore, but they don't want to buy a vehicle just for this purpose, right? So so now sure. they've, got, they've got a snow vehicle for the winter or, you know, a second vehicle for all year round, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, anyone that lives in snow country knows some winters you're blessed. You get a bunch. Well, if you're into snow, right? Like we are, sometimes you get a bunch and sometimes you don't. So you buy something like a snow cat or a snowmobile. And if you only get a foot of snow that year, you probably don't get to use it very much. Exactly. Um, just there. But you still get sure. make on it. That's right. Yeah. So this, a system like this gives you that ultimate flexibility. If you have to leave it on tires until the big storm comes easy to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think somewhere in that shop, there's a set of those mountain tracks with my name on it. So those are actually yours, Nick. Oh, nice. Very cool. <laughs> I figured you'd, you wouldn't mind a couple little scratches from. Uh, oh, never. Yep. Yeah. Chicks, uh, chicks dig scars. That's what they say. It's so. dig scars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. I can't wait to get those things bolted up. Um, you know, we're looking forward to a great winter. Uh, this background behind me here, this is all on the Rubicon Trail, a big ponderosa pine tree here. This is the terrain where, you know, uh, the experiences over the last three years that we've had, all the ideas we've kicked back and forth. Ruby tracks have already been proven out here. And yeah. uh, I, I can't wait now to, you know, fight back with uh, this new bigger and better set. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun to watch. Like, I spend my whole winter in my underwear in the living room watching you guys on the internet have fun with them. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Well, right? Heck yeah. Well, thanks to the invitational, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get an opportunity to have you out here at least for a week or so. Yeah. But you probably will have to put some pants on. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. I don't leave the house. Without <laughs> <me>. <laughs> it's all good. Well, good deal, Scott. And then, uh, being a brand new product and being a, you know, uh, a small operation like you have there, uh, if someone's interested, it's like, what's your inventory looking like? Or as far as these tracks and the availability, it seems like this is going to be kind of a, a special release, at least for this first initial season here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we have, you know, we have lots of the 121 and lots of the 136 for this season um, based on, you know, previous year's sales. Now this is sort of a limited production run. We were only building six sets of these in total. You're getting wow. one set of them and other sets going to uh, a little bit further south there in California than you. And then we're talking on uh, a couple more sets to different people. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there are going to be any left at Christmas time. Wow. But we'll see how it goes, right? For sure. Yeah. So I guess if you're interested, um, folks should be reaching out to you quick and uh, putting their name in the hat. Well, very good, Scott. So uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. I'm uh, feel real fortunate to be able to help bring this thing to the world. There's, you know, I'm pretty well versed in this space. I'm not necessarily in the industry like you are, but I'm a, a big time user consumer, uh, you know, both personally and uh, industrially. So there's nothing like this that's available. And I think that's why I'm the most excited about it. Um, yeah. To get an opportunity to run and just see, you know, it's going to be changing people's outlook on just what a, an on-road vehicle is going to be able to do with these tracks. Well, very cool. I guess that wraps it up for uh, episode four. So uh, look forward to uh, jumping on, seeing what else we can cover. And as always, we look forward to questions. And I'm sure there'll be a lot with this new product coming in and people that are curious. Um, there's never been anything like it. So there's uh, a lot to learn for all of us as far as the mountain tracks and uh, just how capable they'll be when we get them out here in these hills. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting winter, I think. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me again, Scott, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one, man. Good stuff. Thanks for your time, Nick. Right on. We'll see you. Bye.